Is the mic working? Good level? Seems like it needs to go up. For okay, good. Thank you. All right. Um, as we know, uh, Pastor earlier uh, this year, I think maybe the end of last year, uh, decided to have um, some different people from the church share messages on occasional communion Sundays. And back in like May or June, I said I'd do this one. Um, then December came very quickly. <laughs> um, when I think about uh, communion messages or communion passages, the first one that I tend to think about is 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. Uh, it tends to be something that we hear a lot, uh, even maybe just when we're taking communion. Um, to, the, to the point that I don't think I've ever intentionally sat down to memorize this passage, but I have a pretty solid memory of it. Um, I'm going to give everybody a chance to turn to 1 Corinthians 11, um, and uh, I think we'll see how familiar this little passage is to us, but we're going to uh, today look at a little bit broader context, and then even a little bit further, and then we're going to narrow in on a couple of things uh, to think about maybe one area where there's an, an extra interpretation I hadn't really considered before earlier this year. Um, I think we've probably all had the experience where we uh, are reading through God's Word and something hits us in a different way than it did before. Um, in no way does that uh, minimize or eliminate uh, previous ways that we've viewed the Scriptures. It just is God illuminating something to us that we haven't seen in that way before. And uh, I hope that uh, nothing that I say today is going to be heresy. Um, I, I think it's, it's backed up with Scripture, and uh, hopefully I, I don't have to worry about getting tackled off the stage or anything. Um, but the, uh, that's, this is what I'll be bringing to you this morning is uh, some things that I've looked at a little bit differently uh, in the surrounding verses around this most common passage um, that spoke to me differently since I agreed to take this message on. Um, so I'm going, to, I'm going to quote this passage again just as an illustration that I've never tried to memorize this, but this is like so common to us. Um, uh, I think Paul says something along the lines of, I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and said, this, is, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For one of you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I've heard this probably on average once every month or two since I was born, you know, roughly speaking. We've all heard this passage, um, and so uh, it was surprising to me when I was looking through the surrounding stuff, which I've also heard many, many times in my life, that there would be something else there that I hadn't felt like I'd explored before. Um, so feel free to tell me afterwards that I should never have explored it, and that's fine. Um, all right, so additionally, an in, in introduction here, um, as I said, these are some things that came up to me in, in my devotional time between when I said I would take this on and, uh, and now, and I wasn't studying communion in specific, they're just kind of things that came up in, in the different devotions that I look at. Uh, so I'm trying to say, uh, I'm not trying to plagiarize, but there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, I, I, the bones for this message came from With God Daily, which is a devotional from Sky Jatani, and um, a, another devotional that I came across on DesiringGod.org, which is a ministry of John Piper and his church. It's even possible that some of these thoughts may have come from other communion messages that other people shared this year. I do not take good sermon notes, so I might just be copying somebody else. All right. So just to kind of give you an overview of where we're going, we're going to start by viewing the immediate context around these verses that I just read. Then we're going to go a little bit broader to the surrounding chapters. We're going to focus in on a couple of specific verses in uh, 1 Corinthians 11, together with some support from outside passages. 
that section hopefully is going to include some uh, really personal application uh, that we can use in our lives, and um, then we will celebrate communion together. Heavenly Father, uh, as we look at your word this morning, I ask that you would give me your words to speak. I ask that you would give me a spirit of humility, that you would help me to continually remember that I'm speaking to myself as well and not just to other people. I pray that you would help us all to have hearts that are receptive to your words this morning. And I pray that you would help us to not uh, just hear your word and walk away unchanged, but that we would continually be being changed by your word into the image of Christ. In Jesus' name. All right. Additionally, as we start, uh, there are a few times as we look at different passages that I'm going to ask questions, and I could just use them as rhetorical questions and just answer them right away, but my experience has primarily been as a teacher, and I'd be more comfortable asking and actually expecting some answers in some of these cases, so expect a little bit more interaction than you may sometimes. It'll make me more comfortable, so turn on your empathy buttons and uh, help me out here. All right. So we're going to start by reading uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 17 through 34. Then I'm going to ask somebody, uh, it would be nice if it's even like a young person, maybe like an eight-year-old through high school, or maybe somebody, or maybe even college, maybe just a young person, to give us a brief idea of what's happening here, uh, if they can, and if not, then we'll, we'll span it out broad, more broadly. Good, so really try to listen. Uh, especially young people, I want, I'm going to try to ask a question afterwards and see if you can give me an idea what's happening here in this little passage. But in the following instruction, this is Paul speaking to the Corinthian church, in the following instruction, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part. For there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined, so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers... When you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. About the other things, I will give direction when I come. So there's something that's happening in the, in the Corinthian church when they're coming together to have communion that is a problem. Paul points out the problem, then he gives a little bit more description in the middle, and he comes back and he says what they can do to deal with the problem. Can any of the, any young people to start with, I'll start there, any young people tell me what the problem is, what's happening here? Sure, I didn't, I didn't prep Micah for this. Yeah, go ahead, Micah. More important people are having something special? Yeah, so like some people are coming, they're coming with the food, uh, there's a couple of interpretations I've heard about this. Maybe uh, the richer, everybody's bringing their own food and the richer people have these feasts for themselves and they're eating and, and uh, the poor people are barely having anything or nothing. Um, the Lord's Supper in the early church uh, was a meal. Um, when, when Christ was with his uh, disciples sharing Passover, Passover is a meal. 
the bread and the cup are part of a meal. Um, and so people were, they were coming together, and some people were eating uh, more than they, than they needed to. They were getting full and drunk, and other people were going empty. Alternatively, it could be that this was basically a potluck, and some people were going through first and filling their plates to overflowing, and by the time the last people got to go through the line, there wasn't anything left. Those are both things I've heard, and I don't, I don't think the, script, the, the passage tells us for sure either way, but this is the idea, right? Some people are having way more than other people, and this is a problem. All right, um, I'm going to go a little bit b- more broadly. We're going to look at uh, the previous chapter, verses 16 and 17. Um, again, there's context for each of these separate passages as well, so I, I don't want to minimize that. I'm just trying to share these as context for what we're looking at here. Uh, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. And then... In chapter 12, we're going to look at verses 12 through 27. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we are all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. If we look at those verses from chapters 10, chapter 10 and chapter 12, we, we see in this general vicinity, we're talking about the body of Christ. And I think if we look at 1 Corinthians as a whole, I wouldn't be exaggerating to say that unity in the body of Christ is a major theme in the whole book. Um, right back to the start of the book through the end, one of the primary themes of 1 Corinthians is the unity of the body. I'm going to come back to the passage that we looked at, and we're going to look at a couple of little, little subsections. And the first one is 1 Corinthians 11, 20 through 22. I'm going to ask a question after this, so be ready. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. Okay, back in verse 20. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. What does he mean by that? What, when he's saying it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat, what makes it not the Lord's Supper? Anybody have any thoughts on that? This is anybody. I'm not asking kids anymore. I'm asking everybody. He said, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. I, hmm? Okay, your intent is certainly a, a portion of it. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, and so we got this here. The, like, the intent, is it about you or is it about the body of Christ, right? So here, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. The Lord's Supper is intended to be an expression of our unity in Christ as we remember his sacrifice and look forward to his return. So when they were coming together, they weren't eating the Lord's Supper. They were having some ceremony where they were eating food, but they weren't. It, the Lord's Supper is a celebration of ourselves as the body of Christ corporately. When we, we don't take communion by ourselves at home. Like, I, do, I don't get up at 5 o'clock in the morning and have communion, because that's not communion. I can remember Christ's death. I can remember his sacrifice and look forward to his return, but it isn't the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is something that I do corporately with the rest of you. Uh, even the term communion that we use around the Lord's Supper is a term defined by uh, and often translated uh, as fellowship. It's the word koinonia is the word that sometimes is translated as communion in Scripture, but is more often translated as fellowship. All right, we're also going to look again at 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-seven through 29. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Again, verse 29. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. What does it mean to not discern the body? I'm going to let this one be a rhetorical question and share with you two, two uh, interpretations. The, co the most common, I believe, interpretation here, and I believe a correct interpretation, is uh, that the bread symbolizes Christ's body, and if we eat and drink, in communion, and we're not recognizing and remembering Christ's sacrifice, then we are taking communion without recognizing the body, right? That's, Christ commanded us, eat, do this as often as you eat in remembrance of me. If you're not doing it in remembrance of Christ and recognizing that it symbolizes Christ's flesh, then you aren't discerning the body. You're not recognizing the body. Another interpretation that was shared with me in one of my devotionals that I found very interesting is uh, that as we've seen in chapter 10 and chapter 12, right around there, the body is also used as a metaphor for us. If we're eating and drinking without discerning the usness of communion, maybe we're not discerning the body, okay? When we partake of communion while experiencing divisions between ourselves, I think that's not discerning the body. Now, this is a chance for, for you to ask, well, that's all well and good, but how can I apply it? Uh, what can I personally do to promote unity? I'm glad you asked. Um, we are going to take a look at a few other passages now, and uh, I'll, ask, I'll ask some more questions. Um, these next passages are pretty, pretty familiar. Uh, the first one's from Matthew 5, so we looked at it not long ago in our, in our sermon series on Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, 23 and 24. So, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. And I also am going to have us look at Matthew eighteen fifteen. And keep a finger in both if you want to refer back and forth as we're talking about this idea for a couple minutes. Matthew 18, 15 reads, If your brother sins against you, 
Go and tell him his faults between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Question. Based on these two passages, when do I bear responsibility to attempt reconciliation with my brother? Okay? One of the times that it's my responsibility is when it's his fault. Okay? That's what we see in Matthew 18, 15. We see, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. So you are responsible to attempt reconciliation with somebody else even when the split or the, the problem is their fault. They sinned against you, it's their fault, still is partly my responsibility to try to attempt reconciliation. Are there any other times where we are responsible to attempt reconciliation based on these passages? What? When it's your fault. Good. When it's your fault. Uh, we see that in the Matthew 5 passage. It says, uh, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there and go be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. So we're responsible to attempt reconciliation with our brothers uh, when it's our fault and when it's their fault. Okay. I think that pretty much covers it, right? Like this is just something that we're responsible for in general. All right, and now uh, probably one of the most common passages we'll talk about here. I'm sure everybody knows it by heart. Uh, Leviticus uh, 19, 17, and 18. I'm being facetious. Uh, so Leviticus 19, and we'll, we'll sit here for a few minutes. Leviticus 19, we're looking at verses 17 and 18. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. All right, so that was Leviticus 19, verses 17 and 18. And this is in the process of God sharing commandments with the Israelites. And... Uh, that's, that's kind of the greater context here. Uh, he's sharing, sharing these commands, and he starts off by saying, you shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. Okay. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. What's given as the alternative to hating your brother in your heart in verse 17? You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but... What was that? You shall reason frankly with them. You need to talk to them. Okay? Okay. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. The, the alternative is talk to them. Um, so what is the risk of not talking to them? So it says, you shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with them. So I can speak for myself, and I believe I'm not just speaking for myself, that this is a challenging thing, right? Um, when there are problems between you and somebody else, whether it's something that they caused or something that you caused, going and talking to them is not necessarily the easiest thing in the world to do. Um, but we see here uh, some, all, some consequences for not doing it. Uh, it says, following, you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people. And I, I think that this, this, although written specifically to the Israelites, certainly applies to us in the church now. Not necessarily every command given to the Israelites is something that we take as a command to ourselves as the body of Christ in the New Testament and the church now, where we're in this building, I, I think, probably mostly Gentiles. Um, 
So all of the commands to the Israelites don't apply to us. This one uh, seems like one of the ones that makes sense based on the context that we've read in Matthew and in 1 Corinthians, that this, this applies to us. Um, we shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against our brothers in Christ, to paraphrase. If we do not go and reason frankly with somebody when there's a problem, then there's a few consequences, and some of those can be that we incur our own sin. That we actually sin because, as is true human nature, when somebody wrongs us and we don't clear the air, we harbor resentments and we bear grudges. We may, we may even come to the point of figuring out how we can get them back for the ways in which they wronged us. Right. It's a real danger. Um, and we can end up being, in this case, both the victim of sin and incurring and causing our, creating our own sin that is then uh, something that we need to repent of. So what should this look like? Uh, what should talking to them look like? What does it mean to reason frankly? I'm going to first say a couple of things that I believe it does not mean. And then we'll come back and, and see some ways that it can, uh, that it might mean. So first, it doesn't mean that you should assume that your interpretation of every event is 100% correct and go and self-righteously accuse other people. Um, many times, there are multiple sides to things which we do not all see immediately from our perspective. So we may believe that somebody has sinned against us in something, when in reality, we don't know the circumstances enough uh, to take any sort of an accusatory uh, tone. We need to realize that we are all sinful people, and my perspective and view of what has happened may not be 100% correct in itself. However, it also doesn't mean that we gloss over any real hurt or sin that may have arisen from a situation at hand. So what does it mean? I believe that it means uh, that we need to speak the truth in love, as stated in Ephesians 4, which we'll go to in a few moments. In practice, I think this means that when we go to somebody, we need to, to phrase things in a way that leads towards the reconciliation that is uh, desired and spoken of in the passages we've already read. This may mean starting conversations with, it seems to me, or, I believe that you sinned against me when this happened. Or, uh, it, I perceived that blah, blah, blah. Can we talk about this? Okay, It's leading towards conversations, towards reconciliation. The following is a quote from the devotional I mentioned from DesiringGod.org. To some, this will be very difficult. You despise conflict, you despise people disliking you, and you would rather your brother or sister remains in patterns of sin against God, you would rather harbor the seeds of resentment inside yourself, you would rather cover their sins in unrighteousness than have an uncomfortable conversation. Your self-protection, in the end, is hate to your brother. Half the time, while you might expectantly wait for an apology, your brother has no idea he sinned against you. Your noiseless bitterness robs him of repentance and robs you of the opportunity to grow in courage, in obedience, in death to self, in self-awareness, and repentance if you are wrong. I wager that silent resentment has done even more harm among us than contention following plain speech. That spoke to me. Um, finally, I wanted to hit the end of the end of this Leviticus passage, it said, uh, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's a part we are pretty familiar with, right? Um, that's, that's repeated in the New Testament. We've heard, that, we've heard that phrase dozens, hundreds of times. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I have a question for you. Who sins against you more than anyone else? Yeah, you do. You sin against yourself more than anyone else. But do you go around bearing grudges and harboring resentment against yourself? 
maybe for a little while sometimes, okay, we, we, we sometimes might have something like, why would I do that? Like, I've, I've been through this so many times, how do I keep coming back to this sin? So we, we might struggle for a while, but I don't think we usually, typically, bear long-term grudges and resentments against ourselves. Matthew Henry comments on this verse in his commentary, We often wrong ourselves, but we soon forgive ourselves those wrongs, and they do not at all lessen our loves to ourselves. And in like manner, we should love our neighbor. All right, to bring this back to the unity of the body as a whole, let's look at Ephesians 4, 11 to 16. This is, again, a a little bit broader passage on the unity in the body of Christ. It reads, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of God, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when every part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. The goal here, as we see in in verse 16, the goal here is that the body would grow and build itself up in love. Speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. I'm going to jump back one more time to the greater, uh, greater scope of uh, the First Corinthians passage. We're going to go a little bit further away and uh, close by reading First Corinthians 13. Another common passage. This, I believe, is still intended to be part of the context of the unity of the body, uh, unity of the body of Christ. We we hear this passage a lot at weddings, but I believe it is about also about the love that we are supposed to have for each other as the body of Christ. And in Ephesians, we just saw that we're uh, speaking the truth in love to people so that we can grow up together into. Uh, into the, the measure of Christ. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have lo- not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Heavenly Father, uh, as we close our time today, I ask that you would help us to remember that uh, being silent and bearing, bearing resentment and grudges against others is not love. Help us to remember that we are your body and we are called to build each other up and to build ourselves up in love. I pray that you would help us to 
uh, not fall into the sin of silence when there are times that we should speak. And I ask that when we speak, you would give us your words, empathy and understanding, so that we can speak in a loving way and honor you in those conversations. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor, for sharing with us.